Change doesn't change until we change. Amen? If you want to get better, you've got to change something. So what is really important is that the devil's responsibility is to make you get stuck into your past. So that when you wedge between a rock and a hard place, you get stuck in a rut, and you do the same things over and over and over again. You expect different results, and you get tired doing it. Can you hear the man about that? So today we're talking about digging deeper. I'm sorry. Oh, you need to okay. dig, digging deeper. If you take a look at the, if you look at Kakaako, man, there's so many buildings going up, but because, okay, Kakaako is near the ocean line ocean level, it has to go deeper and deeper and deeper, just like this eight, this wonderful free, I mean, uh, a railway that we have here, right? They have to go really, really deep. I was watching them, they had to go you know, a lot of cement, a lot of rebar, and they had to go deep. Why? Because they're just along the, uh, the Pearl Harbor shoreline. So, what does that mean? If we want to go higher in Christ, we've got to go deeper, build a foundation deeper. We cannot stay shallow anymore. Amen? So, if we want to go higher and deeper, we must do some basic foundation work. We we'll all need to go deeper and stronger in Christ in the areas of our life where we are the weakest. And all of us know where our weak points are. So, some of us try to hide those places. You know, when we hide things, okay, why do we hide things? Have you thought about that? Usually it's because you don't want anybody to find out where it is. Sometimes we have sin in our life and we bear it deep within our lives, but that hinders us from growing deeper and stronger in Christ. So today it's going to be self-examination time. You have to start digging deep within yourself. Only you know you the best. Can you hear it? Amen. Okay? You, hopefully you cannot fake yourself out. So if you are honest about yourself and want to dig deeper, this is the day the Lord has made. You will rejoice because of it. Okay? It might hurt a little bit, but that's okay. It's a good hurt because you're getting deeper and stronger in Christ. So, we've heard enough opinions. We've heard enough criticism. We've heard, when well, we've attended so many conferences. What's one more? We've heard enough Sunday messages about certain things. But most of the time, it goes one ear goes out the other. Sunday goes here, and it just goes, and we forget about it during the week, and we come to Sunday again, we try to put it in, and nothing connects. Today... We're going to connect the dots, hopefully, if you are ready. God is ready anytime we are, but we got to tap out. we got to surrender all, not some of the things in our lives, but all of the things in our lives. Does that make sense? If we don't, then heaven, we got a problem, okay? But only you know the right answers to it, okay? God, remember this, God knows our hiding places, there's nothing we can hide from God. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Remember that. Okay? If you try to hide things from God, God goes, Oh, really? Yaki. He look at us and go, <laughs> Good try. Good try, brother. Right? Yeah. We have... You know, even Christians try to hide things. Even though that we know not supposed to, we still hide things from God. And God goes, oh, really? That's important that we do that. He's ready anytime we are. Let me repeat that. God is ready to help us anytime we are. Because He will not change our hearts if we don't want to. Okay? He will not force us to do anything. So we need to surrender. Okay? And surrender on His terms, not on our terms. In times like this, what God is trying to do is get rid of our distractions. Why? Because the devil is the author of mass distractions. For that one, right? He'll distract you with lesser things to do. Oh, you gotta go mow your lawn. Oh, you gotta fix your car. You cannot come to church because you know what? Your football team needs you to cheer at them on through the television set. Isn't it crazy? So whatever it is, it is. But God looks forward to a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. He loves spending time with us. He loves to just sit down and talk story with us. Yes, he's running the universe. He knows when every sparrow falls from the tree. He knows everything about everything. But his number one 
Okay, goal is to spend one and one conversation time with you. Just to follow up. To talk story. Why? Simply because Jesus loves me this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And most of us don't want to bother God because He's God. God says, come on, bother me. Bother me, man. You know what? I want to spend time with you. That's really important to understand that. So, God is God. God is love. He is our Heavenly Father and He looks forward to spending time with you. Hands down. You have to understand that as, as what's really important. When I went to God, I, you know, this is in my early Christianity, I wonder if God was all in for me. How can He love me such a sinner? All the peel out, all the dirty things, all the ungodly things I did, and God still said, Saying I love you in spite of that. Tim, you know what? I love you. I died for you. I'm willing to you. Okay? I'm willing to give my only begotten son to die for your sins so I can be with you. Does it sound like a loving, intimate God? If we understand that, then we will look forward to visiting with God on a continual basis. I think one of the things that God wants us to remind us, and I was reading the scripture in Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, it says, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings. Patient endurance is what you need now. Not later. Not bye-bye. Not manana. It's now. Anybody need patient endurance now? Some of you go through some trials. Some of you go through some problems. And you need this kind of enduring patience. Okay? It's what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Get rid of your distractions. Then you will receive all that is promised. If you continue to do what God tells you to do, you patiently endure, you have confident trust, then it's just a matter of time before God will bless you abundantly above what you can think or imagine. But you got to hang in there. Amen? Confident trust. Patient endurance. Doesn't sound like God is preparing you for something bigger than your biggest dreams. God is very intentional. He does things, okay, not randomly. He does things in your life for your best benefit. He wants to use you as tools in His hands to accomplish His will. 2 Peter 3.9 He wants to use you so that none shall perish. Only you can reach people in the Philippines where you live or in Kalihi where you live. Okay, or in our air, or where you work, or what you do. God will surround you with unsaved people, and He puts you right there to be used as His heart, His hands, okay, and feet to spread the gospel so none shall perish. Amen. He gave you specific skills. He gave you specific, but the same assignment. None shall perish. So that's really important that we understand that. So, if we continue to do what God is asking to do, again, eventually, sooner or later, you'll get it in God's perfect timing. But it requires confident trust and patient endurance. Think about it. A marathon runner doesn't get rewarded at the beginning of the race. He doesn't get it in the middle of the race. He gets it when he finishes the race. Okay? He... I when I took a look at this, but it takes a long time to get ready for the run, right? It takes maybe months or weeks or maybe years ahead of time to get in shape to run. Okay? You cannot say that if you're out of shape, you gotta say, hey, okay, I'm gonna run 26 miles today. Ah! Some of you don't even drive 26 miles rather than run, right? So it takes months. You can start strong and you can finish strong, but it's an in-between that tests your endurance. Your will, your trust, your training, that's important. It's in between the race that is really difficult. And some of you, okay, you're born one day, you're gonna die one day, right? You came into the world with nothing, you live with nothing, but what's in between? It's gonna really matter. And some of us are struggling in between, okay? Why? It gets harder and harder and harder. This is when your muscle aches. Okay? Then you labor and you're breathing. Anybody try? <laughs> yeah, you're running. What happens? But there is a wall that you have to break. Once you break this invisible wall, 
you can finish your race strong. But if you don't break that wall in, in, the, in between, it will discourage you and these thoughts of giving up crosses your mind. And you're running. Why am I doing this? This is stupid. Hey, I cannot breathe. Just like in a marriage. You start off really good. Ooh, then the challenges come. Oh, why did I say yes? Oh, Lord, these dumb kids are mine. Oh, man. And you want to bail out? I want to be single again. Oh, really? And some of us don't endure. How many of us have gone to school? Right? And you being tested, and you go, oh, man, is it worth all of this test? It's just like now we're building an extension and permitting. Some of you know construction. Permitting sucks. It takes a long time. We have the drawings. We know what it looks like. But going to the permitting, it takes a long time. Okay? Patient endurance. But if you want it bad enough, you'll do whatever it takes. If the goal is big enough, the facts don't come. Amen? So that's really important to understand that in between. God wants us to be more like, okay, we, God wants us when we're here on earth to be more like Christ. He, want, he doesn't want us to be God. He wants us to have godly character. Then that's really important to be more like Jesus Christ. He wants us to be spiritually mature. Okay? Not baby Christians anymore. You know, the basic stuff is really good. But you got to move on. You can't stay in kindergarten for the rest of your Christian life. you got to move somewhere, right? He wants, that's called maturity. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We, Christians, okay, have no veil over our faces. In other words, we are saved. We can see Jesus Christ. Sin has been removed. That veil has been removed. We can be mirrors that brightly reflects the glory of the Lord. And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Christ. We're being transformed inch by inch, yard by yard, day by day, year by year, okay, to, be, to look more like Christ. Romans 8, 29 says, From the very beginning, God decided that those who came to Him, and all along He knew who would, should become more like His Son. And that's really important that we understand that. When things start to fall apart, how many of you have been at the at the time in your life that things unravel? You look at yourself, I knuckle. <laughs> what is happening in my life? And we go to God, He says, God, what's happening? Have you been there? My finances are in a shabble, I'm in debt. My wife doesn't like me, my dog hates me. I mean, a no-end job, nah, and we start to complain. Anybody complain? I have many times. Oh, Lord, this woman you gave me. Oh, Lord. Right. Instead of, we should be, you know, maybe, maybe God is behind all of our challenges. Have you ever thought about that? Why? Because He wants to help us grow deeper and stronger spiritually. And that's really important to understand that. God is always very intentional about everything He allows in our life. He is not the creator of evil. He's not the father of all the bad things, but He will turn things around. Whatever was meant for bad, He'll turn it around for good. He'll redeem all of your mistakes, all of your blessings, to bless you, to give you more wisdom, and to help others. Not to go the same way. Amen? That's called wisdom. The opposite of wisdom is foolishness. What is foolishness? Doing the same thing over and over and over again. Things that don't work, expecting to change. It doesn't work. You'll, you know what? It just waste your time and effort. So what is really important, Isaiah 48.10 says, I've refined you, but not as silver is refined. Rather, I have okay, refined you in the furnace of suffering. Oh, really? Instead of saying, why this is happening to me, we should be asking God, what do you want me to learn from this, this suffering? There's something that you want me to, to learn. And that's really important. Every situation in life enters, okay, and when entering your life, okay, you have two choices. Either you can be a winner or whiner, complain, or you can be bitter or better. 
You get to choose the results. Truth is, everyone will suffer, and Christians, you will suffer more. Why? Because the truth will set you free, get you mad, or make you run away. But the truth is the truth. Listen to this. Okay, Job. Everybody read, had the, read the book of Job? You think he had a good life? He had everything, but God took it away. Oh, but he didn't. Okay, you take a look at Joseph, was sold by his brothers, falsely accused of a crime, thrown in prison, forgotten. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and then Ilocano? I'm sorry, Abednego. Okay? They refused to bow and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's golden idol. They were thrown into a furnace. How about Paul and Silas were unjustifiably, unjustifiably beaten and thrown into a dungeon? They didn't question God, but they chose to <coughs> pray and worship God and sing worship songs in the midst of their suffering. Jesus willingly sacrificed his life for our sins. If they suffered, do you think you're going to suffer? In the end, Joseph was elevated by Pharaoh to a higher influential position that saved the nation. Job was blessed double because he didn't curse God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived the furnace that caused the king to honor them and to protect them. He says, don't you touch these boys. They honor God. That is far beyond the furnaces of life. God miraculously freed Paul and Silas, opened prison doors, and lives were changed and lives were saved. And you know what happened to Jesus, huh? He has risen. That's the hope that we have. He created good of what looked like impossible, bad situations, but with God, the impossible become possible. Okay? It is a powerful example that when we Christians suffer, that we can glorify God in our suffering. When non-Christians see us honoring the Lord through our suffering, it shows how real our faith is. But it shows how real our faith is to us also. Are we going to bail? Are we going to, are we going to break through? Sometimes God will heal illnesses. Sometimes he'll take cancer away. Sometimes a person will get worse after we pray for them. But in these times, God can be glorified and honored. And we can learn a valuable life lesson if we're looking for it. Instead of blaming God, we should be blessing God. Amen? Amen. And our faith, this is our faith. This is where our faith and our hope matures. Through trials and hard times. Not when things are good. We can praise God in good times. Oh, thank you, God, for a nice car. Thank you, God, for a this. Can you still thank God when your car is broken? When you're in debt, you can still praise God. When your kids do some dumb things again, can you still praise God for God? Yeah. And that's the choice that we make. Romans 5, 3 and 5 says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they're good for us. They help us learn to be patient. <laughs> And patience developing the strength of character in us and helps us to trust God more each time we use, use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and sturdy. Then when that happens, we're able to hold our heads high no matter what happens and know that all is well with our souls. That's a confident faith that God wants. No matter what happens, God is still God. He still sits on the throne. No matter who's elected as president, God still is in charge of one nation under God. Amen? Stronger hope and faith is rooted in enduring trust and patience. It doesn't grow without facing problems. In the midst of your problems, your faith will grow. It grows in hard times. It becomes more resilient. Just keep believing, keep trusting, keep on keeping on, keep praying, keep honoring God in whatever circumstances that you're in. Keep on keeping on. When you finally break through and not break up, you'll find that your trust in the Lord because becomes galvanized. Then you look at Satan and you go, is that all you have, pal? Is that all you have? Why? Who is in you is stronger than who is in the world. We have all the resources of heaven at our, okay, at, 
and our will. Thy will be done. How does God grow character and helps you grow up spiritually in practical ways? He teaches us these qualities by putting us in the opposite, exactly the opposite situation. Think about it. He teaches you to love by putting you around ugly, unloving people. Don't look at Keith. Don't look at Keith. <laughs> Who was ugly before you, Keith? Oh, and that Karani. He teaches you joy and trust in the middle of suffering and grief. Anybody have, been, have grief and suffering? We run to the Lord, not run away from Him. He teaches you to in peace, okay, in the middle of your confusion, but doubt, fear, and worry just surrounds you. He teaches you self-control when somebody cuts you off and almost hits you on the H1 freeway during rush hour. Or at the DMV. Anybody avoided at the DMV? God will teach all these qualities throughout your life and will be testing you throughout your life. From glory to glory. It's a process called transformation. Being transformed from a little caterpillar to a beautiful butterfly in that process. You will use all kinds of situations in your life to help you develop spiritual maturity and to become more like Jesus Christ our Lord. Most of the time it won't happen on your timetable when you want it. God is not a genie. He won't put some goofy put us in front of you and change you. No. He'll change you from glory to glory day after day. Scripture after scripture. Prayer after prayer. Until you become resilient. If you don't Give up. Today's message is all about knowing your current condition of your spiritual health. It's an assessment. We must answer a few questions honestly. Only you can answer the questions honestly. So don't look at your husband or don't look at your wife. Don't look at anybody. You look at yourself. Okay? It will give you an honest exact assessment of yourself where you are, where your ex is. If you don't know where you are, you're lost. Amen? When you go to a shopping center, you look at the directory. There's a big X that says, you are here. Okay? I remember trying to look. Have you ever been at the, the new Alamana Shopping Center? <laughs> or you go to uh, the Mall of Asia. Ooh, you got to find out where you X. Why? If you want to go. Now, I'm looking for Shirokia the last time. I went upstairs. It's not Shirokia anymore. It's way on the other side of Alamana Shopping Center. Right? By expensive stores, but, and the new food line is down there too, right? But you got to know where your ex, why? Because if you don't know where your ex is, you don't know where you're going and how to get there. And the shortest, shortest distance between the how to get there, or else you'll be wandering all over the shopping center, and you get tired pretty fast, okay? So, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourself. Don't let anybody else examine you. <coughs> examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Genuine being real. Okay? No fake. Test yourself. Don't test anybody else. Test yourself. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is amongst you. If not, you have failed the, the test of genuine faith. Okay? So we have to go. The first question we ask here, we have to really be honest because everything else flows from that. If your beginning is flawed, you end up flawed. If your beginning is honest, you know where your ex is, then you can build upon that. And that's really important. That's how you go deeper. So just circle one of these answers. Okay? It's yes, no, it depends. I am a committed follower. That's number one. 1 John 2.19 says, says, These people left our church, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us when they left it proved that they did not belong to us. A lot of people come to church to raise their hands and you don't see them anymore. Do you think that once a raised man, oh, I'm guaranteed, I don't have to do anything, and you go back, right back into the sin once more. Raising your hands means nothing at all. It's just a physical exercise. You have to start changing your heart. And that's really important. Do I choose to follow and be God on my terms or when it's only convenient for me or whether it agrees with me or not? Is it convenient for me? A lot of people, and this is very true, okay? I suffered from this too. I became a casual Christian. I came to church when I felt like it. 
but Jesus still loves me. So I made all of these different excuses. Oh, I didn't know I have to show up because somebody else is going to, if I don't show up, somebody else is going to fill in for me. Oh, really? Right? And that's really important. So we have to come to terms with us. Am I a real Christian? Really, the only way to tell a person is through the test of time. Okay? Are they consistent? That's the name of the game. Sometimes consistency is every other. Sometimes it's once a month. But you'll see them change. When their hearts change, and they become more consistent. They become more accountable. Okay? How many of you bosses want consistency from your employees? If they show up only once in a while, you look for other employees? Why? Lose money. And that's really important between an entrepreneur and an employee. An entrepreneur takes responsibility. An employee shows up, okay, maybe, and you cannot, you can really depend on them. That's really important. God is looking, Christianity, again, you have to be an entrepreneur. Helping build your father's house, your father's business, consistently. When you're consistent in anything, maybe golf, maybe surfing, maybe do makeup, whether being a resident manager, you have to be consistent. Amen to that? And the more consistent you are, the stronger you will be, the more resilient you'll be. And that's really important that we understand it. Transformations process. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to be legalistic. We're just trying to be honest. But the transformation process is different for different people. Amen? Some will take root right away because why? Why? They come to a point and say, you know what? My life sucks. I better change something in my life. They'd rather change sooner rather than later. If you really take a look at the parable of the four soils, different types of heart, okay? It's a wonderful example. I went through stages of all four Four, four stages of, of a heart. I had a hard heart before. Why? Because it was all about me. I could handle all things. All things are possible through me. Then I found out that I wasn't very good at being me. Then I had, then, you know, after a while I had rocky soil, then I had all kinds of stuff. But there's a time whereby, you know, I said, God, I surrendered. Once I surrendered, took out all the all the rocks and all the twigs and all the junk and made it good ground then what God said man I tell you started to take root to be very honest Lilia grew faster than I did and that made me mad so I competed with her I'm going to show you I'm the man of the house oh really the harder I tried the worse I got anybody so I stopped competing. I just asked God, let your will be done in my life. Lord. We've been together for 32 years and my wife still beats me up. I love it because she loves Jesus Christ more than she loves me. Amen. And we're both licensed pastors. Cool how God works, right? Me, a pastor? Ask Keith. No way. He called me Borok when we were growing up. Yeah. I rebuked that in the name of Jesus. So <laughs> it means prideful. Right? But transformation process in different people, in different timetables. It takes time and patience. No matter what, God waits patiently for you to turn. Because He loves you. And He yeah. wants you to change your life. It's called repenting. But listen to this. Judas was among the 12 disciples, original. He lived, learned, worked, and worshiped with men who God chose to be his closest friends and co-workers, his cohorts. Jesus heard the same teachings, help in ministering to, to people. He saw Jesus do miracles upon miracles, but he still didn't get it. We can come to church and we can sing the songs, we can give and all, but we still don't get it. Why? We have conditional trust not confident trust we're not all in yet we're at 211 degrees one more degree one more you have to cross that line we know that uh, what happened to Judas right 
Instead of running to Christ, he ran away from Christ. God wants you to repent. No matter how close on the edge you are, God wants you to turn around and run to him. Number two, I gave God, gave Jesus full control of my life. Yes, no, it depends. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says, Ask and will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks. You see? He who seeks, finds, and he who knocks, the door will be open. The answer is always no if you don't ask. Amen? Have you ever cried out in desperation, God help me? I'm at the end of my rope. I'm just holding on by threads. Jesus, help me. God knows every problem that you face. He has the answers to everything. He's, he promises to supply all of your needs according to the riches and glory of Christ Jesus and knows exactly when you need them. God's Word has all the answers to all of our problems we encounter throughout life. And the devil will try to distract you not to, to get into God's Word to find the answers. The promises are essential if we want, okay, our, we want our, our, our faith to mature. If we don't feed our faith, we're feeding our fears. That's, that's the only alternative we can understand that. Many people hesitate to ask God or others when they need help because in their minds, okay, we don't want to impose on people. Anybody hate to ask people for help? Come on. Not only me. Or you have a mentality, I can do it. But God will put you in a situation where you have to ask for help. You have to come to Him with God. All things are possible. You cannot leave Him out of it. He created us that way to, okay, to need others and to need Him. It's called community. Coming in unity. And that's how He designed us. I don't care. Okay, all of us have an anointing. All of us have a piece of the puzzle. And if we don't put it in there, something's missing in our life. As a Ohan of Christ. Reuben has something could contribute. Okay? So does Keith. So does, so, so does Scotty. But together, we're better together and stronger together. We are not to compete with each other. We are to complement each other. Amen? That's really important to understand. It's so we think. Okay? He is better than I we are better than me. And that's important because God made us that way. Okay? When God puts you in a situation, okay? When He puts you there that you cannot handle, okay? He wants you to humble yourself. Oh, Lord. And if we don't, instead of humble, we become humbugs. Ah! And we get bitter instead of better. Sometimes God helps you by doing it himself. Okay? By God's grace. Most of the time God helps us through other people. When my car needs fixing, I say, Will, brother, whoo! Then he can direct me or he can help me. Okay? Fixing your golf game, you know, we ask Keith what's wrong because he knows better. Okay? So ask. 